Good evening, I'm Ninian Boyle and in this video we are going to look at how the night sky works from our perspective here on Earth. Our view of the stars depends where we are on planet Earth in relation to the equator and the poles. In other words, when we view the night sky from northern latitudes, say London or New York, it will look different from the view we would get if we were in Cape Town in South Africa or Sydney in Australia. Although there are stars that we will be able to see from pretty much anywhere that we are in the world, there will be stars that we can't see because they are constantly below our particular horizon. As an example, if you lived and stayed in London, you would never be able to see the Southern Cross or the Magellanic Clouds. Likewise, if you lived and stayed in Sydney, you would never be able to see the stars of the constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear. So, if you wish to see all the stars in the sky, you are going to have to be prepared to travel. However, if you lived on the same latitude as, for example, London, but either east or west of that city, you would still see the same stars in the sky after dark as you would if you were in London, as the Earth's rotation slowly brings them into view. Humankind has always tried to see patterns in the world around us, and this is no different for the stars in the night sky. We call these patterns constellations, and there are 88 such constellations or groups of stars that we can recognise today. Some of these patterns would be familiar to ancient cultures such as the Greeks and the Romans, but many would not, as the way that we see these patterns has changed and evolved, even though the stars themselves have not changed their positions appreciably in hundreds or even thousands of years. Constellations such as Orion the Hunter would be familiar to the ancient Greeks and Egyptians, but a pattern such as Sextans the Sextant would not, or perhaps I should say, not by that name. It can be hard to see how the shapes of some of these patterns can be thought of as resembling the particular figure that it is supposed to, so maybe this is an example of a good imagination. It can be easier to understand them, perhaps, when we superimpose the drawn figures on the join-the-dots view of the stars themselves. So who decided on these 88 constellations that we now recognise? There is a body known as the International Astronomical Union, comprising astronomers and astrophysicists from all over the world, who came up with the final decision on which stars belong to which constellation. This was to avoid confusion, and generally to make life easier for everybody, as we are now all using a standard, world-recognised set of rules for which stars can be found in which group. So do these stars have to lay inside a particular recognised pattern to be considered as belonging to that constellation? Well, no, not exactly. But they do have to be found within the borders of that constellation to be considered to be part of it. Some familiar star patterns are in fact not complete constellations, such as the Plough or the Dipper, but merely part of a constellation. These patterns are known as asterisms, and they can be used as a useful guide to the rest of the constellation, or indeed to other constellations and asterisms in the sky. Now, each of these constellations is named using either a Greek or Latin name, or a Latinized version of an English name. There are equivalent English names for them as well, for example, Leo, the lion, or Cygnus, the swan. To confuse the issue, a large number of the stars themselves are given designations from the Greek alphabet, such as Alpha or Gamma. So we get Alpha Orionis or Beta Tauri. Some of the brighter stars themselves have names that derive from ancient languages such as Latin, Greek and Arabic. So you'll find that Alpha Orionis is also known as Betelgeuse, or perhaps more commonly known as Betelgeuse. If you need to be more scientific about it, it is best though to use the Greek letter designation. For example, if you discover a comet and need to report your finding, you might say that it is two degrees to the west of Alpha Orionis, rather than it is just to the right of Betelgeuse. Fainter stars can be found in various catalogues and may have a letter and number designation, but the casual observer seldom needs to be overly concerned about this. As the seasons change, so our view of the stars also changes. As the Earth moves around the Sun, we can see out to different parts of the universe. Also, because the Earth is tilted at 23.5 degrees, the days can get longer or shorter for many of us. 
So I hope that you can see that what we can see in the night sky is determined by where we live on planet Earth and also by the time of year. We have found that the stars are divided into patterns called constellations and each of these constellations is supposed to represent an object, animal or person. The stars themselves have names and catalogue numbers, so finding our way around the night sky should now be an easier experience. So I hope that you have enjoyed our tour of the night sky. Thank you for joining me and I wish you clear skies.